perfect correlation, 175 countries around the world. Then you look at corruption and per capita income. Corrupt countries are not rich. Fairly simple. Then you look at human development index and per capita income. People who do not develop their human capital are not rich. Nothing surprising here. But what is interesting is the pattern repeats itself when you look at 175 countries. So there's a lesson somewhere here. In other words, it's not enough for democratizing commerce to just look at per capita income. You have to look at income inequality. It's not enough if you look at income inequality, but you ought to look at how do you reduce the income inequality by looking at the development of human capital and the development and the reduction of corruption and therefore the development of rule of law. Does that make sense intuitively? Yes, no? Does it make sense to all of you from emerging markets and emerging countries? This is where we need leadership. Leadership is not required in building companies. You do this right, the companies will come to you. If we don't deal with this problem, the companies cannot come. And that's the real message. So we can talk about elimination of abject poverty, people living on less than $1 a day. We can talk about reducing income inequalities or changing the Gini coefficient. But more importantly, we can also talk about eliminating unequal access to opportunities, changing lifestyle inequalities. And since Terry is here, I have to say, everybody can have the same lifestyle. Cell phone is a very interesting metaphor for what I mean by lifestyle. I can have a $30 cell phone, which allows me to connect and sell SMS messages. I can also have $5,000 cell phone, and I can also have a $50,000 cell phone with diamonds encrusted on it, which some people seem to like. It's okay, but everybody has the same lifestyle because they have minimum functionality that everybody has. So we can ask an interesting question. Should we focus on income inequalities or lifestyle inequalities? Okay, reducing inequalities in choice and reducing inequalities in share of voice. So I believe this will not happen by the redistribution of wealth. A lot of companies try it. Countries try it called subsidies. World Bank tries it. Aid. I don't think it's going to work. It can help the very, very disadvantaged, but if you really want to deal with this issue, you have to create wealth. In other words, simple rule is the antidote to poverty is wealth. It seems fairly straightforward. But public policy focus on redistribution of wealth, which people have tried forever, is much less successful than entrepreneurially oriented, market-driven forces which create wealth. Therefore, I prefer increasing income for everybody, increasing income mobility for everybody, so the spirit of fortune at the bottom of the pyramid is increasing access and increasing income, as well as increasing social mobility and economic mobility. It is not dealing with inequalities directly because if we do one and three, the chances of two will correct itself over time is quite high. You have to give more opportunities for people, more hope, more opportunities for moving up the social and economic hierarchy. So therefore, the key assumptions in my thesis is antidote to poverty and inequality is wealth creation and growth. Not just wealth creation, but rapid growth. Rapid growth gives opportunities for everybody to participate in the economy. But wealth creation and growth requires entrepreneurship and innovation. That's one of the things that I find fascinating. Most of the economic development literature and public policy does not focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. They focus on income inequalities, income distribution, all kinds of measures, except the most important, how do you take less and make more? That is what entrepreneurs are all about. And if you want entrepreneurship, you need good governance and reduce transaction costs. And if you want good governance, 
you must have shared goals as a society and the political will to solve persistent problems. Most of them will accept one and two. When it comes to good governance, they shy away from it because it goes to the heart of corruption. And corruption benefits the few. That's always the case. Does that make sense to you folks? Yes? It's fairly straightforward, logical connection. So all that you need to do is not to look at the poor as an intractable problem and not the concern of business, but if you can only imagine that poor represent a market opportunity and you can come at it either a moral obligation, which a lot of people in, in the continent, and European continent, come to terms with, so it's sort of a guilt or a moral obligation to help them. Or you're intellectually excited because you're a young MBA and you're excited by the opportunity to do something good. Or if you're just greedy, it does not matter to me. Irrespective of what your primary motivation is, you will have to end up in the same place. You cannot solve this problem unless you innovate. Business models, new business models, new technologies, new ways of doing things. So innovation is critical, and I've already given maybe I don't know how many examples in the morning and in the afternoon that the poor can be a source of innovation, including simple cards, prepaid cards for your cell phones. Who is more risky, the rich or the poor, more risky people as customers? Rich? No. How can rich be more risky? I want you to think about this. What is a prepaid card? You get paid before you offer the service. What is the risk? Then why do you say poor or risky? I don't have to bill you at the end of the month. I go to Grameen Bank or something like that. 99.5% of the time they pay back and we don't give them AAA rating. And the rich folks, especially in the United States, young kids, they get credit card and they don't pay, 5% default, and we say it's good risk. In other words, the data and our reality and perceptions don't match. So the thing I would say is, not only a poor source of innovation, if you know how to build a business model right, they may be less risky than you think. <coughs> Some of you saw this in the morning, right? How many of you saw it in the morning? Okay, I'll skip it then. Because I thought there might be a different audience. So this is fairly straightforward. How do you go from the unorganized sector to the organized sector? I believe that there are four mother industries. If we can just get it right, societies will develop rapidly. One is connectivity. Connectivity worldwide is done totally by private sector. Of course, the government had to open up the spectrum, but it is totally done by the private sector. Microfinance, or access to credit, access to connectivity, so eliminate asymmetry of information. Access to credit, therefore people can build their equity base. Access to energy and education and healthcare. Connectivity, I think, will take place. All five billion, six billion people will be connected. It's only a matter of time. Microfinance with NGOs and some private banks now starting, it's not there, it's not a done deal. There's a lot more discussion about education and health, at least a lot of discussion, but very little discussion about energy, because energy is critical to multiply your own resource. And that's that simple. So personal productivity, which is the elimination of abject poverty, requires at least four critical elements. So the first question is, therefore, are we going to make money doing this? How many of you have seen these pictures? Is there money to be made here? Or no? How many of you believed 10 years ago that the poorest people in the world could gravitate towards the ad most advanced technology in one step? I'm assuming cell phone is a reasonably advanced technology. And a few people who believe it became quite rich. That's a different story. 